Hi, jumping right into an editing Kenny moment. This video is very different from other bad movies in a beat I've done if you're familiar with my series. This one is a lot less funny and more like analytical, you know, putting my art ho hat on. Also, I do not go criticizing basically scene by scene the way I kind of do other videos. So if you want to see that, feel free to watch any of my other videos. This one is more so just like a review. Either get a feel for what the movie was like for me before you watch it or kind of have a place to kind of <laughs> complain and commiserate um, after you watch it in the comments. Either way, it's going to be a fun time. Do you ever wonder? Buy a muscle. I just want to make a TDLG joke. Sorry. <laughs> I'm filming early this week, I know. So I'm probably off, off center already. Hi. Did I have my mic on? I do. <laughs> Hi, it's Kendall here. <laughs> if you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up on Skillet Biscuit? And happy Saturday when you're seeing it. But look at me like planning ahead. And Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies in a Beat. The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Though today we're meh, we're not look eh. I was gonna say, this isn't a bad movie. It's not great either, but it's not a bad movie. Like I liked it, but I can, I can see why someone would call it bad. <laughs> Last week we talked about my recent discovery of the most wonderful, awful place on the planet, Passion Flicks. And we talked about the first movie I saw on the streaming site that's just devoted to your favorite romance novels turned into a Hollywood film. It's remarkably terrible, I loved it. And we talked about the first movie I saw called Afterburn Aftershock. It is a mess. I also love how so many people said that they actually uh, subscribe to Passion Flicks because of that. You're welcome, I know. I know you're just so excited. But if you haven't checked that out already, you can check it out up above, or you can check it out in the Bad Movies and a Beat playlist. Now this week, uh, we're talking about a movie that I didn't really plan on talking about. I kind of learned about it right when everybody else did, right when it came out. Uh, and I ended up watching it because like, why not? And I considered whether or not I even wanted to make a video on it because I didn't really put this in the vein of like a good movie, but it's also, in my opinion, not bad enough to call bad. It's very much so in the same avenue as I put like bad hair. It's like, I can see what you're going for. And there are some weirdness and parts at which the movie kind of falls apart and loses itself. But overall, I wouldn't call this a bad movie. Again, by no means perfect, but bad, eh. With that said, I know like over the time I've been doing bad movies in a beat, people have been asking me to do, you know, maybe a good movies and a glam, which I was considering doing for this week. But I still think this one, eh, this one's decent and I haven't figured out some witty title for that, like, Good movies in a glam, bad movies in a beat, uh, decent movies in a dish. Maybe I can do a mukbang. But there was a good movie I wanted to do this week and I didn't get around to it. So maybe I'll do that next week. We'll see, my period's coming up. It might take me out of commission. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was watching this movie and as I usually do, anytime I'm watching a new movie, I tend to tweet about it aloud. And this movie kind of kept me teetering, if you will, back and forth, whether or not I liked or hated this movie. <laughs> and I've never watched a movie and was so unsure from the entire experience, you know what I mean? But this movie had me saying the entire time that depending on how this movie ends, specifically, if this bitch don't die by the end, I'ma write a letter. Dear Mr. Royal Hampton, <laughs> I am a white woman in America. This week, we're gonna be talking about Netflix's brand spanking new dark comedy drama called I Care A Lot. This movie has garnered quite a bit of uh, controversy, has started quite a lot of discourse, and I've noticed that a lot of people hate this movie, <laughs> which admittedly surprised me. I <laughs> and so when I heard that a bunch of people hated it, I couldn't help but ask 
hmm, I wonder why. And so while I was skimming through some of the reviews of the movie, everyone hated the main character. She was so quote unquote unlikable. She was this just caricature of feminism. She was this money hungry sociopath, unrelatable and unlikable infuriating, that's a word I heard a lot from a lot of people. And I was reading these comments, I couldn't help but think like, yeah, <laughs> that, that's kind of the, it's kind of the point. And so today, I guess I'm gonna be defending the film for all intents and purposes. Again, I feel myself being somewhat of a contrarian and I joke about how much uh, <laughs> art people get on my nerves, but I feel as though a, a lot of people kind of miss some of the nuance of the movie because it is kind of a distracting, um, is this what it's like to be a Showgirls fan? <laughs> I realized while I was editing this video, I actually bring up Showgirls and particularly my video on Showgirls so much. Um, so if you haven't seen that video, even though I don't really want to bring people's attention to it because MGM claimed it and they don't deserve to make a freaking penny off of me, they can literally eat a fat one. But for reference sake, uh, you may want to watch that video before we get into this one. Or you can just have a little fun being a little bit confused by some of the more esoteric points that I make here, some of the more pretentious points. Even though this video is pretty much in its entirety quite pretentious, uh, you know, do with that what you will. There's so much to kind of distract you, kind of so much silly to distract you and so much to galvanize and infuriate you that I think a lot of people kind of m miss the reason why, why they are so galvanized, why they are so offended, you know what I mean? And so I'm just gonna do my little art people spiel, I guess, about why I'm going to somewhat defend the film. now. With that said, I'm not gonna say that everything is defensible. There are parts of this movie that I find criticism is greatly warranted. Uh, or if not criticism, certainly some side-eyeing. And I'll talk about that more towards the end of the video. Okay, side note. <laughs> I don't know how this looks on camera, but oh my God, my skin looks good in person right now. Holy guacamole and frijoles on rice. Arroz, bitch. I gotta preface that I have not seen anything from the actors or the directors or the writers or the creators i've not listened to what they meant to do by making this film to do that ultimately undermines how effective they were in articulating those messages it's a lot easier to see what a director was trying to do when you know what they were trying to do and so in an effort to not have my observations my opinions my criticisms uh, thwarted by their own intentions i've decided to just forego even knowing what those intentions were. And so very early in watching this movie, I got the vibe that not necessarily meant to be understood in the realm of explicit realism. It's, in t for all intents and purposes, I've conceptualized it as satire. A lot of the, a lot of the criticisms I was kind of reading that people said, it's like, this would never happen. This would never happen. And I'm like, that's not really even the point. <laughs> this movie more than anything in my mind, at least as I was watching it, is that it's satirical and particularly more specifically, it's satirical about capitalism, how white feminism and white femininity plays into reinforcing capitalism, how those intersect under neoliberalism. Now, I'm not gonna say that I am like the most knowledgeable about any of these three things. <laughs> not to say that it's not something I'm trying to get more knowledgeable about. These are just kind of the knee jerk reactions I had when watching it. I'm like, oh, this is definitely about some white feminism. <laughs> white feminism as I like to define it, again, by no means any like Oxford dictionary definition by any means. A very narrow, very specific, close proximity, uh, superimposing of white patriarchy, but just making it so that girls, more specifically white women, can do it too. In this movie in particular, it's very much so kind of criticizing it under capitalism, right? The white feminism that I've kind of interacted with, especially as a black woman, it has been this very like shallow reaching, a lot of like girl boss rhetoric, but it doesn't necessarily do anything to dismantle white supremacy, uh, <laughs> even white patriarchy to many degrees. It's more so just the superimposing of those principles, uh, those privileges, those powers, and just kind of says, hey, we should have the right to be like, white collar criminals as well. <laughs> if white men can subjugate 
minority parties, then so should we, <laughs> girl power. And I think in many ways that this movie is kind of criticizing that, turning it up to 11, seeing how the public can understand and react to that. So as I was looking at it through this lens, I couldn't decide whether or not this was actually the angle they were going for until the very, very end. Spoiler, I liked the end. <laughs> I mentioned Showgirls briefly, as I said, like I feel like a Showgirls fan, but um, I think even more so as I'm continuing to talk about this, because a lot of the defenses that a lot of people had when I did my video on Showgirls, uh, a lot of people said, well, the director, the dude that made Basic Instinct, Paul Verhoeven, whatever, you know, he's known to be a satirical director. For some reason, when Showgirls came out, people didn't think he was being satirical in that movie. I still think is a bit of a cop out in that movie specifically because one, what was he being satirical about? Consumerism, that's, I guess you could say that. Critical of misogyny, which I think is hilarious because that entire movie was so misogynistic. And I'm not even talking about the nudity. I'm talking about the sexual assault scene in particular, put in there as if to say, I'll shock you with this thing that you have no idea what it is, as if women don't, know what being in danger by men is like, so we need to be attacked with it, which uh, is just the very, again, essence of misogyny. So whereas this movie I feel like is more, dare I say, articulate about the criticisms that it has and the messages that it wants to convey. Again, by no means perfect. Now, for those of you that are more familiar with my reviews, I tend to take like a, like a general run through of the movie and kind of doing my commentary along the way. Um, give it a comedic spin, if you will. Thank you, thank you. I find myself very hilarious as well. Today's video I don't think will be nearly as funny because A, I'm not gonna be doing like a scene by scene walkthrough. There are a lot of things that are structurally meh about the movie, <laughs> but I think that's less of an interesting thing. And to be honest with you, if I sat here and did a run through of the film proper, it would easily take me a hot 45 minutes and then I would never get to the points that I wanted to make in this video. I guess maybe I could do two videos. Or for some of you that like the idea of me talking for an hour and a half, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Do you know how long you have to be seated talking to end up having an hour and a half video? No, my mouth get dry. Okay, but anyway, yeah. I say that to say I will not be doing a scene by scene run through of this movie because partially I want to encourage people to watch it for themselves and reach their own opinions um, on whether or not they enjoyed the movie. So with that said, if you haven't seen the movie already, you might find this video a little lacking, but I will do like a general rundown of what the movie is about. So, but just not the kind of walk along the story the way that I usually do. Main character is a woman named Marla. And note that I said the main character. She's not the hero. <laughs> She's by no means who we should be rooting for. And I think that's where a lot of confusion comes up. People think that she's supposed to be a hero when in actuality, she is simply the main character. But Marla, you can look at her and kind of immediately understand that she's, for all intents and purposes, an archetype of this sort of white woman capitalist girl boss, the blunt bob, she's a soul cycler. <laughs> that place is a cult. I've gone cycling. They turn the lights down. They give you inspirational speeches. They light candles. They remembered my name. Creepy. <laughs> Stop going. I was like, nah, 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 nah. It's a pepperoni and I still don't really feel safe in here even if it wasn't. She has a very thin frame. She's conventionally attractive. She's blonde, sort of feminine demeanor, but, within this kind of subgenre of like white girl boss power. She has quite the genteel, mellow disposition, vague, insincere kindness and pretension. I'm here to help. That for many could circumvent her very calculating and malicious and greedy inner core as like opposition to say conventional white masculinity that is often shown to be quite violent and aggressive. She uses white femininity. Again, she's all of these conventionally beautiful things. She's mild mannered, mild tempered. She doesn't often raise her voice. She's this kind of general quiet, 
danger. Going back to kind of how I think of white femininity, I don't think of it as any less dangerous than, than white patriarchy, honestly. But again, I'm coming from this as a black woman. <laughs> so of course I have my own point of view and perhaps my own biases. And I think what turned some people off about this movie is that they were expecting to see a kind of begrudgingly likable con person, Wolf of Wall Street-esque anti-hero um, just in woman form, you know, white women can do all the crappy things that white men can do. And what they got instead was a person who was greatly unlikable. Despite, again, her encompassing all of these things that would have, again, been applauded. This, this desire to pull oneself up from their bootstraps, to choose not to be poor. <laughs> that kind of rhetoric of like, I worked my ass off and I lied and cheated and still the, stole, still the, if I had to. And instead of her being this sort of anti-hero, she became greatly unlikable. She is the very distillation of capitalism <laughs> and white feminism. And this movie took the stance to not make that a positive thing. <laughs> People, again, begrudgingly liked the main character of Wolf of Wall Street. What was his name? In many ways, rooting for him, they, again, found him to be this kind of begrudgingly likable anti-hero when in actuality, he stole from poor people who were trying to, you know, get a better life for themselves and their family. And somehow we think of him as this like brilliant con artist instead of, you know, him being the very personification of avarice and greed under capitalism. And I think what I appreciate in that this movie does make Marla so awful. <laughs> She's just awful. <laughs> Is that it gave her stance as this hyper-capitalist, the negative insight it should have had. It, it, it looked bad, it should look bad. Again, if you haven't seen the movie, Marla's whole crime is not stocks in the way you know Wolf of Wall Street was, but basically she is a state appointed legal guardian for elderly people who don't have the ability to take care of themselves. And what she kind of does, get rich old people put into homes so that she now has control over all of their assets and she ultimately ends up stealing their money in order to pay for her services. And that's how she amasses her fortune. If we're trying to get really real, I question how much white feminism and such narrow progression, I should say, is not simply just um, the other half of the coin, <laughs> the other side of the coin of white patriarchy. To what respect can white feminism really be called opposition to patriarchy? When in so many respects, a lot of the privileges they share overlap. <sighs> in many ways, bedfellows. And when white specific feminism kind of starts chewing at patriarchy, it ends up kind of cannibalizing itself, especially under capitalism. And I think this movie is pretty clear on that being its criticism. It, it's the core nature of how they created Marla as a character. Again, she is this kind of caricature, this satire of, of the girl boss white feminist. <laughs> For instance, this is just one of many examples, but let's talk about her first altercation of the film. Basically, she is just exiting a hearing in which she essentially kidnapped someone's mom and stole all her fortune by putting her in a home when she didn't need to be there. The person's son comes out to kind of tell her off. I'm gonna keep my eyes like this while it dries. But yes, he comes out, he's screaming, calling her a bitch, saying very gendered insults to her. I hope that you get uh, sexually assaulted and murdered. And then he commences to spit on her. And her retorts are also very gendered. She essentially says, you know, is the reason why you're angry is that you lost a hearing to someone with a vagina. Spit on me again, I'll rip your dick and balls off. What's interesting is that in a way, these two are mirrors of each other. The movie is very clear about the things, almost <laughs> almost too clear at some points, uh, in a way that kind of lacks subtlety <laughs> at some points. But it's very clear that it's about a white woman who's stereotypical in all ways that matter, who is able to do all of her crimes as this sort of character caricature of white femininity, not even a caricature per se, but just like this, again, this distillation of white femininity. She can sort of care in her way 
out of criticism in a lot of situations, you know, claiming how much she's trying to do it for the betterment of other people, the betterment of, in this case, the elderly. The beauty about the writing around Marla is that she is so viscerally unlikable. That's what makes at least the components about her so genius. Marla is unlikable. It doesn't make this a bad movie, in my opinion. It makes, I think that's one of the, the it's one of the things to truly applaud about it, how it was able to condense all of these things that are so much deserving of criticism within one <laughs> two hour movie. Actually less than that, probably within the first 30 minutes of the movie, you really get a condensed version of how awful she is and what she represents. The weaponization of white femininity, particularly under capitalism. Though she is, you know, paying herself with these people's money, she is the again, this very demure, very traditionally appearing feminine person that the people who she's stealing from, she just you know, feel so deeply for weaponize their standing in the the world as being seen as pristinely feminine in a lot of situations. He appear as someone who would never steal from the elderly. I feel like a lot of people don't like this movie because they they were expecting this sort of begrudgingly likable anti-hero when in actuality in something like this, you know, fraud, predation on the on the poor or in this case the elderly the most vulnerable shouldn't be something that we think of just like, oh, you, it should be unlikable. And I feel like this movie was very good at making that so. A lot of people confuse an unlikable character or even an unrelatable character as necessarily a bad one. And therefore this is a bad movie. For me personally, her being as effectively unlikable as she was is what made the movie decent. Not great, but it made it good. It made it worth watching. But I really applaud that about this movie, that it was able to take those kind of Wolf of Wall Street-esque capitalist narrative that are often applauded and really turn it on its head and make it something worthy of intense, scrutiny and criticism. So what the movie largely entails is what happens when Marla's crook enterprise, you know, messes with the wrong person, someone who has money and resources to combat her, someone who is male. And that presents itself in when she tried to steal money from a very wealthy older woman and put her wrongfully in a home when she didn't need to go. And her son, Roman, comes to, you know, go head to head. We going, we gonna do this. But again, in many of the same way that I was kind of alluding to before, this man isn't very different from her either. They share in many ways similar enterprises. He also gets his money from, you know, less than savory means. I think it was something about the Russian mafia or something. Um, so essentially most of this movie is just the power struggle between Marla and Roman. And ultimately when that struggle reaches an impasse, Roman and Marla are shown to be very much so the same. They both clamor for wealth and power through illegal means. Again, her stealing from old people and him participating in vague mob shit. Along the way, despite all the hiccups, ultimately that singular desire, the desire to be as wealthy or more specifically to be as far away from poor as possible, that singular desire will circumvent any of Marla or Roman's transgressions. Marla tries to kill him, um, tries to become his guardian. And that's after she kidnapped his mom and <laughs> tried to steal all her fortune. And Roman tries to kill her several times. Oh, I also forgot, uh, Roman ends up trying to kill her girlfriend. And she's like, you know, that was bad. But at the end of all of that, they decide they wanna be partners to make more money than they've ever made before because that's what's important. That's the only thing that's important. Yeah, we tried to kill each other, tried to harm our most beloved people in our lives, but hey, we can make bank. I think what's so interesting and how almost ludicrous, how ridiculous that notion is, is that it's something that happens every day. Look at white politicians just going back and forth, putting a pride on the floor, Republicans specifically. Y'all look real stupid. Mitch McConnell, <sighs> Mitch McConnell was a bitch. <laughs> so is Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz, someone need to beat the <laughs> out of Ted Cruz. <laughs> at the end, Marla largely gets 
all of the things that she'd ever wanted and ever acquired through her use of her white femininity, through her use of her obsession with acquiring more wealth. She becomes more wealthy than she'd ever imagined and that is still not enough. She, she even says as she's like on like a Fox business you know, equivalent, basically saying, I'm just getting started. She creates a conglomerate where she can in mass become guardian over all of these vulnerable old people while simultaneously giving this whole rhetoric that a lot of like large capitalists do. There's no secret to my success. You know, I just simply worked very, very hard, did what needed to be done. I had strength and determination, yada, yada. And she applauds this zeal or whatever that she supposedly has, as opposed to her just being the very personification of again, avarice and greed, desire to go as low as necessary in her mind to undermine all of these marginalized and vulnerable people. Again, in this context, we're talking about old people, which was also a very poignant decision to make. I feel like everybody gets mad when you start with vulnerable, nice old ladies in particular. They knew what they were doing <laughs> when they made the object of her, of her connery, vulnerable old people. Under capitalism, people every day <laughs> are, are reaping no repercussions for any of their actions. Um, so I, I didn't think I was strange either. But with that said, as I was watching the scenes of her getting everything that she could desire, I couldn't help but feel like there's not enough time left in this movie. And if she don't die, this movie isn't a criticism anymore. <laughs> it's more so of just like, yep, this is how it is and this is how it is. So when she does ultimately get shot at literally the last minute of the movie <laughs> by the first man that she was arguing with in the beginning of the movie, I ultimately liked that she got shot. <laughs> that was what I was waiting for. I was like, if she don't get shot, I'm over it. But as I started to think about it, I really understood how that scene was so crucial to kind of putting in perspective the whole narrative that was supposed to be written throughout the movie. It was to illustrate that A, Marla is not a hero. <laughs> you are not intended to root for Marla. And I find that very interesting because so many people were saying they really wanted me to root for her. No, I don't understand how anybody could have misinterpreted that. There's no way that this movie wanted you to root for her. She's just, the main person in the story and she's just awful. Just because she's the lead character does not mean that she's a good person, nor does it mean that they thought she was by making her the main character. That was also a criticism that some people had that I saw where they were like, they didn't really give her a background. She was just kind of this villain. And I was like, there's a reason why they did that as well. Again, they're not trying to make her into something good or desirable. They're not trying to humanize a person that treats old people like that's not the objective here. I would have more problem with that. To give her all of these reasons for why she was terrible would ultimately undermine the overall message of that people are terrible every day with and without excuses. She is not a hero. B, that her crimes did not stop her from being successful. And that the only person that could really stop her from being successful were ultimately the people that she hurt and victimized. And C, and I don't know if this was what they were going for, but this is kind of how it came off to me. White patriarchy and white misogyny tends to kind of cannibalize white narrow reach feminism more often than the other way around. Because again, patriarchy is much more cemented social construct. And so the, the kind of irony that the person that was so vigilantly, violently against her in a very, again, very gendered way in the beginning of the movie ultimately is the person who is violent against her and it ends her life. I wouldn't say that it was necessarily condoning patriarchy or misogyny or, or white man violence against white women. Uh, I don't think that was it. It's just more so cyclically, this is how it kind of goes. I think I, I even have to be careful of this sometimes because I find myself saying, well, if you show misogyny in the movie, then you are misogynist, right? It could also be that people are misogynists and this is a portrayal of misogyny, right? There's kind of a matter of factness about her getting shot. Also to clarify, this is in no way meant to applaud patriarchy. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not trying to do that either. I'm not trying to applaud patriarchy or misogyny or to, to demonize inclusive womanism, feminism. 
But it's more so a criticism to say that narrow feminism is still at the mercy of patriarchy in many ways because it continues to reinforce those structures, especially under the guise of a pursuit to equality and especially under capitalism. Now with that said, I've kind of talked about the more nebulous nature of the film. So I, I will sit down and talk more in depth about some criticism about it. This criticism on white femininity, or at least as I'm reading it, was made by a white man. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is the most poignant criticism to be made, um, you know, uh, as a person who benefits the most from white patriarchy, you could look at this a bit cynically and say, well, is this you just poo-pooing feminism in general, as opposed to poo-pooing kind of the strife associated with, again, narrow reach white femininity and feminism. And I think that's a fair, uh, <laughs> I think that's a fair criticism to have. To that, I don't really have a defense because Ultimately, again, as a white man who made this movie kind of denouncing patriarchy and denouncing misogyny, also to some degree at some points reinforced it while also demonizing white feminism. So you could argue while profiting off of doing those two things, what good is his message at all? Which, fair. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have any defense to that. Two, partially relating to that in the kind of ways in which it criticizes misogyny. And maybe it's even to some extent uh, problematic that I'm even questioning this. That's also a fair criticism to have towards me. But I did wonder as I saw who they chose for the male lead, his name is Peter Dinklage, if I'm not mistaken. He obviously is a man that has dwarfism. I feel like there's two ways to look at this. You can look at it as either it was just a choice because he's a great actor, fair. He did a great job in my opinion. There's no acting issues generally in this movie. I think everyone's pretty solid. But with there being so many undertones about denouncing misogyny, I can't help but question to what extent height has been used sort of as a motif in this movie and kind of side eye <laughs> to some extent how that was represented through a character who visibly has dwarfism. This isn't just related to him as a character. Marla is significantly taller than most of the men she ends up getting in arguments with, right? That's reaffirming her as this kind of girl boss, right? And to show him, I guess in a less cynical way, you could think of it as him being used to show that even as a man of short stature, he was able to acquire all this power and wealth. Or if you're a little more cynical, you can wonder, is this supposed to be somewhat of a distasteful joke in that his masculinity is so small, for lack of a better word. Thankfully, that's left up to interpretation and I, and I appreciate that more so than them making some really distasteful joke or some like, you know, blatantly ableist bullshit because of that. And so I can't really allude to that being a criticism per se, just more so of a, I have questions. <laughs> I wonder, I have questions about that. My hair looks so bad and I think I should put lashes on, but I don't want to, I'm lazy. Another criticism that I hear quite a few people bring up, her being in a lesbian relationship and ultimately being a villain. And as a person, as a straight person, I don't think I have the right to really say that you should or shouldn't be angered by that. I kind of internalized it as like, she can be a lesbian and also be a piece of <laughs> Those two things don't necessarily have to do with each other. Yeah, she was a villain, but it wasn't like she was a villain through her lesbian relationship. I think her lesbian relationship was probably the most humanizing part of her. <laughs> like her not being awful all the time. She at least to some extent loved this person. Granted, she kind of sold her out for money. <laughs> which again is, I'm sure people do all the time. Not sold her out, but she got her ass kicked because they were in like the mafia or whatever. And she was like, yeah, even though you beat up my girlfriend and she almost died, I'ma still work with you. <laughs> I wasn't quite understanding that critique, but again, that could be by proxy of me not having the optics to really understand that. So that could be it. Anyway. I say all that to say that I did generally enjoy the movie. Um, by no means is it perfect. Do I think I would watch it over and over and over again? No, it's not like a super rewatchable movie. There are, again, certain points where I'm just like, okay, well, this is kind of stupid. I think, I think it had points to make and whether or not they were super effective, ultimately, I guess, depends on who's watching it. And again, the thing that I did really like so much about it is how effective it was at making me hate Marla. 
that's a talent. To write a character that effectively, geniusly bad, as in a character so awful that it makes you visibly retract and hate her the way that I did throughout that entire movie, the way that I rejoiced when she got shot, that's a talent. <laughs> oh, I know I gotta put lashes on because this looks weird and I know it needs lashes and I just don't want to do it. With that said, if you have seen the movie, please feel free to let me know what your thoughts about it are. Maybe you completely and utterly disagree with my views, my interpretation. That is also interesting to me. I don't know why, but as I was putting those lashes on, I just kept hearing white people talk all night in my head. <laughs> white people talk all night. It's not just for white people but white people love it the most if you like this video feel free to like this video comment down below and i'll see you guys next time